Hallelujah. It's so good to know Jesus, isn't it? Amen. It's good to see everybody out today. It's good to be able to be here. Presence of God. Fellowship of God's people. Everybody say amen. Hallelujah. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to read verses 44 through 46. And then uh, drop down in that chapter a little bit, or back in that chapter, to read verse 38. And uh, so Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 44 through 46. And of course, uh, I'm still dealing with uh, kingdom messages, and we have entitled this one to, is the treasure. Everybody say the treasure. Amen. Kingdom messages number five, and this one is going to be called the treasure. And I know they like to have titles for putting it up on the website and, uh, and so forth. So uh, let's read. Uh, it's starting in verse 44 through 46. Both of these parables that we're going to read are, are kind of tied together, uh, just as you find some um, that Jesus told that were kind of tied together uh, to do with the lost sheep, to do with the prodigal son, and also the lost coin were kind of tied together as well. So are these ones as well. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. And again the kingdom of heaven is like unto the uh, merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Drop backwards in that chapter to verse 38. And uh, this is all in the same context. Uh, Jesus is explaining the parable of the weeds, explaining the weed, the tares, and the, sh- and the good grain. And, uh, and he's in explaining it. He's going to give kind of a little bit of understanding to move ahead with. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one. And we'll come back to that proverb a little bit later probably in next week's message and so but I want you to take a look first of all at what he said the field is the world everybody say the field is the world everybody said amen let's pray shall we Lord we just love you so very much I thank you Jesus for your word today so much of your word has to do with your kingdom your kingdom coming your kingdom being a part of our lives And Lord, even in your example of a prayer, the first part of that is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Lord, today as we continue these session of messages on your kingdom, God, let your anointing be in this place. Let it touch all of those that are here, all of those that are not here that may be listening or watching it later or now. God, I pray for your anointing upon me as I preach. Jesus, you know me so very well. You know that I need you every step of the way. God, to try and do it in my own power, in my own wisdom, or my own understanding is always, always the wrong way to go. So Lord, I pray for your wisdom, your anointing, your understanding in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And you can be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I uh, I did a little research on on treasures uh, as a part of this message, and I uh, just found some kind of unusual uh, thoughts on treasures. And first of all, there is a fellow uh, by the name of Forrest Fan, and you can look him up if you wish to. Back in the 1980s, he got cancer, and he didn't think he was going to live very long. And so he did something. He wanted to be remembered. He'd written a book and, and he wanted to be remembered after he passed away. In the title or the description of this man, it calls him a real life Indiana Jones. And so he must have been some sort of treasure hunter. He looked for, for things that were valuable and so forth. And so he did want to be known for something. And so what he did is he gathered a bunch of the treasure, I guess, that he'd found over the years or that he had accumulated. And he put it in a chest and had decided that he was going to go hide it somewhere. 
and uh, and wh- so that people would just and they, they would come and they would get the clues. Oh, I should mention this: all the clues that he gave to finding the treasure were written in a poem that he wrote. And also there's some clues that are uh, related to the treasure, where it might be hidden in the book that he wrote. Now, he didn't die. And so he also didn't hide the treasure initially. And so about, uh, about in the year 2010, or in the year 2010, he's now 80 years old and uh, still hasn't passed away. And he finally decides he's going to do something with this treasure chest that he's got in his house. So he goes and he hides it. And he writes the poem. With, and the poem has all the clues if you ever want to go looking for it. Uh, you can go find all the clues in this poem and in his book and you should be able to find it. Nobody's found it yet. So if you're ever in New Mexico, somewhere north of Santa Fe in the hills up there, is a treasure worth, they speculate, between one and three million dollars hidden in a treasure chest up there somewhere. Nobody's found it yet. And uh, so if you, uh, if you go up that way and you decide you want to look for it, uh, I suggest that you read the book and read the poem. I read the poem and thought, yeah, you know, there's a lot of variables in that poem. <laughs> I don't know whether I'd be able to make sense of it all. Uh, in... in June of 2011, and I was just looking at at treasures that were found recently. And so in June of 2011, uh, they were digging up or investigating an old temple in southern India. And the only reason I put down southern India because I couldn't pronounce the name of the place. So I thought rather than try and pronounce the name of the place, I would just say it's in southern India, okay? is probably the greatest treasure that's ever been found. In fact, if you look at the value of treasures and you, you Google it, it's number one on the list. And the reason it is, it was when it was found, there was, uh, it's probably worth billions of dollars and there, the, couldn't even speculate as to how much the total amount would be. I suppose it would vary with the price of gold. There was one ton of gold alone just shaped like rice. Just a whole ton of it if you can imagine a ton of gold. As well as that, there was, there was other uh, items of gold. There was diamonds, other precious jewels as well. And uh, all in this one temple in southern India. And that was uh, probably the most expensive, most valuable treasure that's been located over the last little while. I thought it was kind of interesting. So are any of you treasure hunters? Any of you, no, none of you ever. What's that? Geocaching, there you go. Uh, nowadays, you, you kind of have to cheat a little bit because it's you know, all the GPS, yeah, it's all there. We did some geocaching with, uh, with my oldest son when we were up on Mount Washington one time and went and found a few things up there and some were easy to find, some were harder. Uh, but you ever see these guys that go around the beach with these metal detectors and, and find things? So, well, that happened too as well. And one of the ones that I read, this fellow was going around, they were looking for the guy had lost his hammer and couldn't find a hammer in the field and got a friend of his to come and find with his metal detector and they end up finding a treasure in his field. Yeah, talk about luck, eh? (laughs) So, but when we're talking about the treasure that we're dealing with today, we're not talking about earthly treasure. And I, I really wanted to bring this to you. I've preached this from this passage of scripture and there is a justification for preaching it this way because it does apply that it could be compared to us looking for something of value and finding it and be willing to sell out everything that we have in order to acquire it and purchase it and I think we have some sort of justification for that because Jesus said we have to lose this life in order to get that next life if we want to keep this life then we're going to lose that life to come and so uh, there's got to be something within us that is willing to give up everything in order to acquire the kingdom of God if we hold too fast for things like money or or things that are around us us, if we think that they're so valuable that they can't be given and, and placed at God's disposal, then we probably love them too much and we're a little too attached to them. But I want to look at this a little differently today because I really feel like uh, the definition for the kingdom of God and what we've talked about in the past messages needs the context of this particular parable so that we can place it where it needs to be. This is so vital. First of all, you find out in this passage of scripture that I read to you that the kingdom of heaven is, is like a treasure that's hidden in a field. 
So, that a merchant man, when he comes and he finds the treasure, he hides it and then decides to purchase the whole field. Now, take that in context, because Jesus said the field is the world. Well, I'm, you know, as much as we use that parable to preach about us wanting the kingdom of God, we didn't purchase this world so we could have Jesus. So as much as that context would, would apply in certain areas, when you look at it, if that is true that the field in this passage of Scripture where Jesus is defining the previous parable also applies to the parable as he continues to work his way through, then you'd have to look at it just a little bit differently. And, uh, and, and so when, when I start, begin to study this out and begin to look at it, I find that, that I have to look at this in terms of that God, when he looked at this world, that he found something of incredible value within the world. He found, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, uh, Peter calls the church a peculiar people. And what that is defined is, if you look at it, it is a purchased acquisition. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, when God was speaking about the children of Israel, but also Israel applies as a type to the New Testament church, he says, now if you will obey my voice and heed my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me among all people. And uh, the, uh, the English Standard Version say a treasured possession. God found a treasure in this world. Now, I don't know if he was looking that hard, but I kind of think he was. I kind of think that, that when he looked at what went on in this world, and I know God knows the beginning from the end, and we've studied all of that out, and that if God doesn't know the end, then he's not really God at all. But, but I'm kind of thinking that it's like God searching for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. That when he looked at this world and judgment had come so many times because of sin, because of, of mankind falling into sin, and so that their imag- every thought of their imagination was only evil and wicked continuously, that God thought, this is my creation. I need to find out what's good about this creation. Otherwise, I may as well tear it all down and start all over again. And so God is looking in this world to find a value, something of value that would redeem this creation that he had, had made. And he came into this world and he began to look around and he saw a treasure that was worth something. Can I tell you what that treasure is according to Peter and according to, to Exodus and, and the writings back there? That treasure that he found was his church. Think about this. He saw you and me and he realized and, and began to think that, that they are worth me giving everything up for. Now, I know the enemy would like us to think that, that we're not worth too much. In fact, is he, he goes to great efforts to try and make you think that, that you can't do anything in the kingdom of God. Because if he can't get you to backslide, he's going to make you useless. And so he would like you to think that you're nothing in the God's kingdom. And I want you to know today that when God came into this world, he found a treasure that was of such great value that he had to be willing to sell everything that he had in order to purchase it. So it wasn't just good enough that that he went and got the treasure because the treasure was hidden in the world. He needed to do something for the whole world. He needed to purchase at the price that was required. So we find that 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 God placed that kind of value on you and me. I've often thought as I and you've heard me say this that as a pastor and a preacher I I have sometimes questioned the wisdom of God. Because I've wondered why God would use someone like me. Why God would use someone like you? Because you see, when I stand in the mirror, I know everything there is about me. And I think to myself, you know, God, there's better orators in this world than me. 
God, there's, there's, there's got to be people that you could use that, that would be far better at this than me. And yet God looked down on me and he thought, hey, Ron Nickel has enough value that I am going to purchase this world. I will make sure that, that he knows and understands that it's not just, he's not just another person that dwells in this world, but he's a treasure in my eyes. A peculiar one, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and some of us are more peculiar than others, Ted. Uh, oh, not mentioning any names, of course. But uh, So a peculiar treasure, which actually means special. It means different. God doesn't want us to be the same as this world. Can I tell you that? He f- considers us to be special, to be peculiar, to, be, to stand out, to be separate. And we'll probably preach about that a little bit more in, in the next session that we have. But in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, if you want to turn there, I'm not sure if you have that, your Bible's with you, but if you do, you can turn there. And uh, so Philippians chapter 2, whoops, I don't even have it marked, but I'll find it. Chapter 2 and verse 7 and I'm sure they got it up beside or behind me there. But I want you to take a look at the way the scriptures define this. So, first of all, the merchant man, when he finds the treasure, he hides it. Then he goes back and he begins to sell all that he has in order to acquire it in our parable. And same with the man with the pearl. So, 2 verse 7. Uh, let's go back one verse so we get context. Who, though he was in the form of God, talking about Jesus, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Everybody say emptied himself. By taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So, so first of all, I want you to take a look at how God did this. Because it is so beyond sometimes our our thinking that we cannot imagine the one that created everything, the one that made this universe, all the stars that we see, that if you look at the creative time in Genesis, you see he created light, he created all the environment, the, the firmament that we see around us, the atmosphere that we're able to breathe. He created it and placed it just far enough away from the sun that gravity is not going to crush us, but it's not going to turn so fast around that we're going to get thrown off. Have you ever done that in, when you're ice skating? Yeah, you know, you have the one person in the middle and then you have about 10 people and you begin to go in circles and the outside person eventually can't hold on anymore when you get going fast enough. Just think about this. God has it so delicately balanced that despite the fact that the earth is spinning, going around the sun and all the rest of it, the earth isn't going to cave into the sun. It's going to stay on its orbit going around there. Then it's going to spin just fast enough to counteract the work of gravity that is created in the world so that we're not crushed and we don't fly off. God did that and I want you to know you and me are here today because God did a good job of it amen now I know when they go into space and there's no gravity it kind of changes things it even says that they grow a little bit because gravity kind of compacts you ever notice that as people get older they kind of shrink well it's just you know compaction and all of that so I'm thinking I should go there for a while I might make six feet one of these days but, uh, but it has the opposite, opposite effect. So, so God held all this in balance and then you look up at night and we were, my wife and I camped up here this last week and, and when, when everything's dark and the sun goes down and, and, uh, and there's no lights to be seen, I want you to know it's pretty awesome. You look up in the sky and you see all those stars and, and you're thinking not only does he, has he placed them, but he knows each one of them. Amen. God's pretty good, isn't he? He's pretty good. And then you think about, just think about yourself. Have you ever looked at those, those diagrams, those medical diagrams of what you look like inside? You know, it's just, it's pretty amazing when you look at all the different systems that have to work so perfectly in order for us uh, to be able to live. And uh, when they don't work, of course, then, then we need medical help in order to keep us going or, or we can come to God and God can heal us and make us well. But, but it's pretty amazing the way God put us all together, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. You don't even think about breathing. Right, right. 
You just breathe. You don't get up in the morning and say, well, I better tell my heart to pump a little faster now. Just does it. And then if you exercise, it'll pump even faster to get that oxygen continually flowing. You know, some of us exercise, you know, a little slower as we get older. Uh, and, and all of that. And here we have the God that created everything has now decided that he needs to sell everything in order to purchase his church. So, what did he, how did he do that? Well, if you can imagine, if you would, and I know it's probably a little far-fetched for all of us. We've read nursery rhymes and stories when we were younger, the prince and the pauper, how the prince decided to change places and, and all of that. And there's been countless stories of people that have, or fictional stories of people that have put aside their, their kingdoms in order to be one of the common people. None of those even compare not even a little bit with what God did. You see, because God walked away from his throne, took aside the fact that he was a spirit and sovereign and everything that was holding everything in place and decided that he was going to come in the form of his creation. Wow. Wow. If you can imagine, and uh, there's been writers over the years that have written about it, but if you can imagine God in the form of a small child that is absolutely helpless, totally dependent upon a young teenage mom to take care of him, to feed him, to change his pants, to dress him, and make sure he was safe. Wow. Wow. The incarnation is one of the one of the greatest stories. It is the greatest story ever written that God would do that. He stepped away from a throne. He took aside his heavenly robes of glory and he put himself in the shape and the form of a small child so that he could purchase the field so he could have you and me as his treasure. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. He didn't only decide that he would take and put aside all that was there and come in the form of a child. But if you read on in Philippians chapter 2 and, uh, and verse 8, As soon as I find it, I have it here. But emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, Brother Ted was teaching this morning and the next verses coincide. They come right after that. That because of this, He has a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. But what I'm reading to you came before all of that. That because He did this, because He was willing to come and because He was willing to die, that that name is a name above every other name. And being found, it says, in the fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto the death even the death of the cross. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says this, that you were bought with a price. The Amplified says that that price was by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Acts 20 and 28 says, the church of God was purchased with His own blood. First Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 and 9 says that we were redeemed. The word redeemed means that we were purchased out of slavery or bought back out of slavery. And it says this, with the precious blood of Christ. So not only was God willing to make that step and come from the throne of heaven in the form of a man, in the form of a child to start with, but He spent 33 years walking on this earth and then allowed them to place Him 
on a cross. Many of us, I don't, I don't know whether you've ever watched that show by Mel Gibson, The, the Passion, but we, it is hard for us to imagine the brutality of that day and age. It's hard for us to even think about it, so much so that when he tried to depict it in movie form, it was had a restricted uh, designation because of the brutality that happened to Jesus. And the thing is, he could have called ten legions of angels at any time to come and remove him from that situation. But I want you to know that he saw what He was doing it for. He saw you and He saw me. And despite all of the pain and despite what they were doing to Him, He thought we would be worth it. Whoa. The Bible says that where your heart is or where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I kind of think that God was not only talking about us and what we treasure, but I kind of think that He was also indicating this is where He was. You see, His heart was on you and me. His heart was centered on you and me, and that made it possible for Him to endure all that was happening to Him. Because you see, it it wasn't pretty. It wasn't sometimes that's depicted in pictures and, and in statues that they placed up. It was brutal and it was bloody and the Bible says that he was hardly recognizable anymore as a man because of all that they had done to him. Let's stand together, shall we? Think sometimes in our living for God... Stephanie, if you want to come. In our Christian walk, we bring it to a place where we're willing to do the things that we need to in order to continue to be what we are. Does that make sense? Being a child of God is never just doing, it's not doing your duty so that you can continue to be who you are. It, you can't be a child of God by discipline alone. Because some of it can just lead to self-righteousness or, or becoming a Pharisee. You can't do it that way. And I'm, don't worry, I'm not advocating that you're not obedient to what God wants you to do. We do need to be obedient to God's Word, Right? The Scripture in Exodus, if you will obey Me and keep My covenant, and and then you will be a peculiar treasure unto Me. So that's a part of it. Always has been a part of it. God hasn't changed. He's the same at the beginning and the same at the end. But there's something beyond that if you want to truly be what what God wants you to be. You've got to take a trip. You've got to realize what was paid to purchase your salvation and your redemption. You've got to go back and, and just take a look. And if you, if you can't visualize it in your mind, ask God to give you a revelation of what He did for you. Because for every drop of blood that fell that day, the one song says, A million tears were washed away. Like the rain that washes earth and sky comes in and it cleans every part of our lives. The blood of Jesus. God saw us. This message has been in my heart and my mind since we started these messages on on the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, Jesus, we say it often, died for us. Yes, He did. Why don't we go there? Just close your eyes for for a little bit. Just make your way back. Think about your salvation. Think about the day that you first realized that God was real. 
Think about how you understood and knew that He cared so much for you that He would leave it all behind and that He would allow them to place Him on a cross and crucify Him so that that blood that was shed on that day would wash us and make us clean. Hallelujah. 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 Don't you ever let the enemy tell you that you have no value. You were purchased with something so great and so valuable the world cannot even understand its value. To the world, he was just another man that died on a cross on that day. But to those of us that have had that blood applied in our lives, we will never ever be able to think about that in that way ever again. Because this was the Lord of glory come down to this earth so that he could die and he could shed his blood and I could be his child. Hallelujah. 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 Let's begin to thank the Lord together, shall we? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, that you called me, you reached for me, you allowed me to be able to see and to know, Lord, that that blood could be applied in my life, that my sins could be washed away and I could be clean. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you just begin to express your thanks to Him. Begin to verbalize and to vocalize what you think right now and what you think He'd like you to feel right now. And let Him know how much you appreciate the cross and the blood and the sacrifice that was made because He sold everything to purchase you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you and I worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.